Well, today starts the first week of our At The Movies series, and if you've never been here before for this, you are in for a treat. For the month of July, we'll be taking different movies and interweaving a biblical message within its storyline. Time and time again, Jesus told stories, and he interwove the truth of God into these storylines for people to understand. Today's story focuses on a person's journey to accomplish his dream, but in order for his dream to come to fruition, he first needed a chance to prove himself, or so he thought. Now, I think we all have moments or maybe seasons when we're fighting the mentality that somehow, some way, we've got to prove ourselves in life. We have to accomplish something in our lives in order to be seen, in order to be heard, in order to be recognized, in order to be thanked, in order to be appreciated, or feel good, or to feel like we've won, or, or to, in order to make it, or just to be loved. We all find ourselves from time to time trying to prove to the world that we're somebody. Maybe you're trying to prove that to somebody today. Maybe you're trying to prove to your father in hopes for his recognition. Maybe you're trying to prove yourself to that friend group that you're cool enough to hang out with. Maybe you're trying to prove yourself to God that he's going to take notice of you and bless your life. Well, today, my hope and my sincere prayer is that you'll come to believe this about yourself, that in Jesus Christ, you have nothing left to prove. Jesus proved everything on the cross for your life. His love for you, his commitment to you, his worth that he speaks over you, his future for you, yet we still tr struggle to try to prove ourselves in life. Just like Kurt Warner did, Let's take a minute and watch our first clip together. The place that you're supposed to throw the football from as a quarterback. Well, as long as your front line is protecting you, that is. But sometimes the pocket collapses on that quarterback and you're getting tackled in more ways than one, and especially more than you're able to complete that pass down the field. And in that level, life feels like sometimes, you can tend to feel like you're, you're getting tackled in all these different ways, more than you can advance that football down the field. Yet still, the pocket is the best place to throw the football from for a quarterback. It's still the preferred area to make the decision from because hopefully the plan is unfolding in front of you and that receiver is getting open and you're able to see how that plan's gonna materialize. But no plan is ever perfect. Some plans just get blown up. And sometimes staying in that pocket leaves you on the ground and in pain. And yet, you can never take the pain if you're always running from it. Just like Kurt Warner was doing, he was always running out of the pocket. See, Kurt was a star quarterback, great quarterback, but he couldn't learn how to stay in the pocket. He refused to. And if he didn't learn how to do that, his skill set would never get him to advance in this game. If his coach didn't develop a drill that would teach Kurt to get that ball out quicker, this story would have never been written about his life. What if the pain and the adversity that we face in life is not a sign of God's displeasure for us? I mean, what if it, what if it was a set of circumstances that God, God used to teach you and me how to advance that football down the field in a way that's better than my design plan? What if that was the case? What if it was, it was more than us just doing it our own way? There's a lot of people that try to advance the football field down the field for their lives only to find out that they were now actually further away from what God put in their heart and in their life. Moses was one such man. He knew God had something for him. He knew God wanted to use his life in a special way. He'd been told that. He'd been began to share that in his life. People spoke that over him. As time went on, as he grew older, he grew impatient, though. And he took matters into his own hands. And so when he saw that the Egyptian taskmaster one day beating that Jewish slave, he killed him. He killed him. With that, put Moses back a good 40 years as Moses now started running from Egypt for his life. He was trying to 
prove that he was something. He was trying to prove that, that he is what, what the Israelites hoped he would be. He was trying to prove to people who, 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 he, who they thought he was. Namely, their savior. The hero. Peter was really the same way. Peter needed to be heard. He needed to be seen. He needed to be first. He needed to be great. One night, Jesus got up from the dinner table that he and his disciples were, were seated around, and he did something kind of unusual, at least for our understanding. But to Eastern culture, his actions would have packed, just punched something huge there. It was a powerful punch. Jesus picked up a towel, basin of water, began to wash his disciples' feet. To Jesus, in that moment, he was, he was picking up the football. He was in the pocket. He was doing what he came to do. Now, for us, it's a weird thing. Like, I don't want anybody touching my feet. But that practice was customary in any Jewish home. But nobody had done it that night, you see. That isn't until Jesus stepped into the pocket. And when he gets to Peter, Peter refused. He said, Lord, I should be doing this for you, not you for me. But Jesus said, hey, listen, if I don't do this for you, you got no place in me, Pete. Jesus wasn't rejecting Peter. He was simply showing and telling the disciples that they can't do anything to prove themselves to Jesus. So he already knew their condition. He already knew what was going on in their lives. He already knew their hearts. You see, that's the beautiful thing about Jesus, and that's what's so different about him. That's why Jesus is different than any other person, any other religion, any other human philosophy. Everything, is based, everything else is based on what you have done to prove your worth. Everything in life. But to Jesus... He proved your worth by giving his life for you. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Huh. It wasn't when we proved ourselves that Jesus gave his life. It wasn't when we got it all right in our lives and remapped things and did a better job. Now, Christ died for us in the middle of our mess. His love towards you is not based on your merit or your accomplishments. It's based on his goodness. It's based on his love for you. For Kurt Warner, he was trying to figure that out on and off the field. He started to learn that life is a lot more than just making the team. And it wasn't until he met somebody who was up against a lot more in life than a game of football. Let's check it out. Sometimes we really wonder why. Why did things have to happen this way? Why couldn't have things been different? God, why do you allow this? And what does my future look like now? We hear things like, well, God's got something special for you in life, yet we never thought that this set of circumstances should be a part of what's special. In fact, how is walking through fire anything special at all? It's hard to figure out who you are in the midst of that pain, in the midst of the questions that we have in life. And for Brenda, she didn't have every answer, but she came to know that it's only Jesus Christ, the creator of our lives, that can bring definition to us even in the pain, especially when life seems flipped upside down. Personally, I've seen and I've walked with a lot of people who have gone through tremendous amounts of pain, suffering, difficulty in life. Witnessing that pain, I don't know how people can make it without God in their lives. I don't know how people can exist or find any definition in life outside of God. Especially when difficulty is on your doorstep. And that's where God's grace, it comes in. It's available if you want it. It's present if you 
reach out for. It's sufficient when you're weak. And we're all weak at times. We're all works in progress, meaning we're not finished works. Meaning God's grace is able to transform not only any situation, but any human heart as well. See, we don't have to prove ourselves to him to get his grace. We don't have to prove anything. The Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one can boast. First of all, our lives can be saved by grace, can be intercepted by the grace of Jesus Christ, can be pulled out of whatever pit we're in, not by proving ourselves to God, but by God giving his hand. Not by passing every test that there is in life. See, grace is the proof of Jesus' sacrifice, not the proof of yours. It's not how much you sacrificed in your life. It's not how many great things that you have done. It's not how wonderful your moral integrity is. Grace is based on Jesus. The Bible says... The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of our sin, all of our shame, all of our shortcomings, all of our screw-ups, all of it has been placed on Jesus on the cross. So it's not what you've done or what you haven't done that somehow gets God's good side towards your life. Grace does not operate by what we do. It operates by who he is. It operates because of what he has done. Jesus came to the earth. He lived a sinless life, gave himself up on a cross to be crucified. He was, he was buried in a grave and rose three days later, my friend, so that whoever believes in him could have this kind of grace forever. Faith's function we're saved by grace through faith. Faith's function, our role is to receive what grace offers, not try to prove ourselves to God. That renders his grace useless in our lives. We can't do anything to earn God's favor or acceptance. We have to simply believe him and receive the grace that he offers to us. Grace is a gifted opportunity. It's an opportunity that unfolds for your life from God himself. Sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. For Kurt Warner, he was having a hard time wondering about that as well. He was beginning to question God's goodness based on the circumstances of his life, based on why he wasn't able to make it. He was wondering why God wouldn't give him what he wanted. And I think we all can relate to that. If we ever had that conversation with God, God, why aren't you giving me what I want? See, I think God does that to help us a little bit so that we realize that life isn't just about what we want, but it's about relying on his grace, not our own performance. Grace is God's way of redefining you. This season, right now, here today, you are in a season of redefining. But you got to let grace happen to you. See, God won't just redefine the circumstance. He wants to redefine you. And if we trust him through the difficulties, in the valleys, up in the mountains, God's able to work his grace in you so that it's not the circumstances that change, but it's your heart that changes. It's your identity that becomes more like Jesus Christ. It's, it's your character that changes. It's your outlook that now looks different to see the bigger picture. Because that's what the grace of God does in our lives. It's not only there to save you, it's there to change you. Grace doesn't, it's not just a one-time event. 
But even in the midst of our mess, grace is chasing us down. Grace is wanting to take you over. Grace will turn you upside down like some white water rabbits that you're not in control of, but it will also bring you out stronger, better, and much, much more like its giver, Jesus himself. Grace chooses you. And grace said, Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. You are chosen today by the grace of God. It's not about what you choose in life. It's about who chooses you. And his choice for you is not dependent on the circumstances. Nor was it for Kurt's circumstances. Life still has a way at letting us know that we're not good enough. There's always somebody better. There's always something we miss. This was Kurt's shot, and he blew it. From here, he'd go back to Cedar Falls, Iowa, stocking shelves at the local Hy-Vee supermarket. He didn't even get one chance to throw that ball in that practice. With Brenda going to nursing school now, it was hard for them to actually pay the bills. Life was getting difficult. Somehow, some way, they worked through these difficult times only to find more difficulty. Brenda's parents tragically lost their lives in a tornado when it leveled their house in Arkansas. Nothing got easier. It just got more difficult. With all the hardship, it leaves you wondering, where are you, God? Do you not see me? Do you not recognize what I'm going through? Do you not see my pain here? He does. He really does. But he also wants you to see that grace is greater than your ability to make a mistake. All life's hardships aren't because you've done something wrong. See, if it was you never making a mistake in your life in the first place, then you could live independent of God. Grace shows us that we can't live that way and that we really do need God. In fact, we were created to live a life with God and not to go against the grain of God's grace. Kurt Warner, despite all of his difficulties, he kept taking one step at a time. He kept throwing one ball at a time. He was invited to play for arena football for the Iowa Barnstormers, something that he really didn't want to do. It was not the NFL, but it was an opportunity. So he played. And he succeeded, so much so that he got another shot. The Rams took notice of him, ended up giving him a tryout. The only problem was the offensive coordinator couldn't stand him. He hated the idea that this arena football guy would even get a tryout for this NFL team. He didn't want to give him a look. He he blamed him for the mistakes of all the other players. But someone else noticed him on that field. Somebody else believed in him. Someone else saw something in him. Grace was still making a way. God's grace believes in you. From the beginning to the very end of your life, God sees you. In spite of the entirety of your life that he saw, he decided to choose you. He already knew everything that you're going to choose. He already knew everything that you're going to do. He knew it all, but he still chose you. His grace picks you every single time, hands down. You're not the last person to get picked on his team. He chooses you every time, even in spite of you. And that's what's so hard for us to understand at times. It's why it's so difficult for us to really believe. But God's grace helps us with that, too. See, when we believe in Christ, something profound begins to happen. Christ takes up residency within us. The Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you. Grace is now in you. And Jesus now starts that work so that we can't conjure it up ourselves. We could never do that. We, we try to feel good ourselves. We try to do things ourselves. We try to perform. We try to prove ourselves. All that to fill that void, only to find it never gets filled. God wants us to simply trust his validation on our lives rather than you trying to make yourself feel good about yourself. God, and, and when you just chill and kind of 
trust what he's done for you and what he says about you, the work of grace really starts to take effect in your life. Grace does something profound within us. Grace lovingly forces you to see yourself how God sees you. Not how you see yourself. Not how other people have seen you or see you now. Not how those labels have labeled you. Grace changes the way you see you. That's miraculous. It's life-changing. It's grace. The Apostle Paul tells us this amazing reality that even before he made the world, God loved us, chose us in Christ so they'd be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure to do it. He knew you, he saw you, despite your mistakes, despite your shortcomings. Grace himself chose you. He adopted you into his family. Grace brought you in. If you're adopted, your parents choose you. They select you. They could have chosen somebody else, but they wanted you in the family. And it's the same with God. But grace requires you to change your attitude about you. Rather than believing your feelings of rejection, grace takes your side and brings you into his side. Rather than believing your feelings in that way, God, God brings you right in, right into the family. That's the process of grace. God enjoys bringing out what's special in you. And you might feel like you're an underdog, but destiny, destiny belongs to the grace of God that lives in you. August 28th, 1999, the Rams quarterback Trent Green suffered a season-ending knee injury in a preseason game. Kurt Warner, who was finally ready to step into what he had always dreamed of. But this time, he was a different man. Because grace never leaves us where it finds us. Grace will never leave you the same. Grace's power changes who you are. For Kurt Warner, grace changed him. It wasn't easy. It wasn't a 10-step growth process. Things didn't just line up for him. Life kicked his butt, but grace healed his wounds. Grace strengthened his core, established his character, made him a better man than who he was years before. Grace made him ready. Grace was not a one-time act. Grace is an ever-present, ongoing reality. Max Lucado says grace didn't just happen. It happens. It continues to happen. It doesn't just save you and expect for you to go on your way. It doesn't leave you after it saves you. No, it strengthens you. It transforms you. It enables you, empowers you so that you're ready for what God's prepared for you. Paul wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Not be strong in how smart you are. Not be strong through your own willpower and determination. Not be strong through your many accomplishments in life. Not be strong through you trying to prove yourself. Be strong through grace. It's the same now as it was back then on the cross. The same work Christ did on the cross then is the same work Christ, that, that God does through Christ in you now. His grace is still working on the cross that he calls you to bear in life. But you have nothing left to prove. Not to God. Not to anybody else. Not even to yourself. Let grace prove you now. Let it define you and redefine you. You're not defined by your failures anymore. You're refined by them. You're God's remodeling project. So let grace have its place in you and through you. I want to encourage you this morning, give in to grace. 
You got nothing left to prove. If you want to give into his grace today for the first time, all you have to do is believe that his grace is there to save you and to change you. The grace of Jesus Christ invites you to come to him. Invites you to give your heart to him. Invites him into your life to change you from the inside out. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for some time. Maybe grace has gotten a little bit stale in your life. I believe God is urging you this day. I believe that God is speaking to you this day. I believe he's saying, I want to find what's special in you. I'm going to enjoy bringing that out of you. His grace is an old hat. His grace is ever present today, right here and right now, for your life. Let it happen to you. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to earn it. So right now in this moment, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet and simply reach out to God and say, God, I need your grace right now. Jesus, I need all that you offered to me on that cross. Even if I don't fully understand. Help me not to prove myself. Help me to let grace prove my life. So God, we reach out to you in this moment. We want more of you and we want grace to redefine our lives so much that we look different than who we were before. So if you want that today, your role is faith. Your, your, your function is faith. God, I, I receive that from you today. God, I pray today that each person here, those that are joining us online, God, that your grace would begin to redefine the stories of their mind, the words and the conversations that they allow to uphold in their lives, Lord Jesus, that your grace would, would actually begin to change those and start to agree with you on who you say they are. I pray that your grace will redefine each and every one of us according to your worth, not to the measurements of this world not to us trying to prove ourselves. So God, let us be testimonies of grace, stories of grace. We might not go win the Super Bowl that year like Kurt Warner did, God. But Lord, you have something for us to win in life. It's only by your grace can we make it. It's only by your grace that we're saved. It's only by your grace that we're changed. It's only by your grace that we win. So we give our lives to you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's lift our voices to the Lord right now and worship to him. Would you join with us?